Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivers. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. I am a clinically practicing physician and surgeon in the metabolic health space. And as such, I meet a lot of new patients. And one of the primary questions I ask my patients, it's kind of interesting, especially in the US, I don't ask people, are you taking any medication or supplements? Because <clears throat> that's a stupid question. <laughs> I ask them, what supplements are you taking? Because almost nobody in the US is not taking something. Very, very bizarre, very weird. However did we exist as a species? So one of the things I want to talk about today, and this is the foundation of today's visit, is marketing and bias, both in terms of the pharma space as well as the supplement space. And it's so, so important that we are able to step back from this incredibly powerful, convincing snake oil sales that you see. If you have a TV at home, and we don't, but anytime you watch TV, anytime you watch one of my YouTube videos, I don't control those ads, but there's almost always an ad for some expensive medication. The pharma ads run rampant on the radio, in social media, and on TV. And they're usually advertising these ridiculously expensive, very often harmful drugs. And when they repetitively bounce those things off you, and tell you how incredibly well they make you feel. And you see people going, Ozempic, or whatever it may be. Or is Lamomonobodumina bad? That, that helps you to get rid of zits on the, on the tips of your hair. We become so victimized and so indoctrinated with advertisements. Do you know, folks, and, and this is a little quiz for you. There are only two countries in the world. There are only two countries in the world that allow pharmaceutical advertising of medications. Advertising. Obviously the US, and bizarrely enough, New Zealand. No other country ethically, 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 allows pharmaceutical companies to advertise medications that require prescriptions. Because ultimately, what they're doing is they're usurping and bypassing the role of a physician or a nurse practitioner or a PA who should have the knowledge of whether a medication is appropriate for you or not. And very often I get patients coming in demanding a certain medication because they saw it on TV or they saw some influencer tell us it's the right thing to do. Now with Google and everything else, I'm, it's a very appropriate equalizer. And I think Google is a fantastic place for doctors and others, anybody, any biohacker to look up information. But what the pharmaceutical companies do by these incredibly powerful advertisements is they neuter, they remove our ability to direct healthcare appropriately. And I know the healthcare system is completely buggered and broken, but I am very, very, very heavily opposed to the marketing of prescription drug pharmaceuticals of any kind in social media, on the TV, on the radio, or in print, in any kind, because it is completely biased towards sales, not healthcare. And not only that, if you look at the budget of that advertising, can you imagine why drug prices are as high as they are? It's not just for profit, it's to cover the marketing, especially the most profitable medications, where the marketing is through the roof. It is appropriate to have pharmaceutical reps go in and introduce physicians to new medications and to show them studies and that kind of thing. I think that's okay because we then have discretion, but there should be no incentive. There should be no incentive to use that product. Don't buy me a swimming pool if I use, if I write a thousand prescriptions for this drug, which they used to do. So, the rep should be there to bring information to us, but not to give us incentive to use that medication over others or to use it because we're getting something for it. And that's very, very important. So I feel very, very strongly about marketing and messaging when it comes to pharmaceuticals, particularly those that require prescription, because I want to be independent in which medications I prescribe rather than being a victim of advertisements to my patients where the patients come in demanding something or where the pharmaceutical people come in because I want to do a risk-benefit 
analysis. And often these medications have huge risk associated with them and we minimize risk because it's in the small print and we maximize some mythical benefit from these medications. So be very, very cautious about that. Okay. For example, just as an example, when I was in medical school, when I was growing up, when I was resident, even here in the US and in Canada, we were very opposed to the biologics and the monoclonal antibodies that affected our immune system. And we would only use them for life threatening disease. Now we're using them, and I understand the severity of this, but we're advertising and marketing biologics and monoclonal therapies to things like psoriasis, to things like skin disorders, to things like hair loss, um, where somebody's life doesn't depend on it. But what they don't tell you is by dumbing down your immune system and your abilities respond, uh, your ability of your immune system to respond to something, that's a huge problem. And you can die because you're on a biologic. And they, they mention that, oh, uh, tell us if you're on steroids, tell us if you're on TB. That kind of, Be very, very cautious about steroids. Be very cautious. And they get given out like candy. Be very cautious of the risks. And yes, there's benefit under certain circumstances, but the doctor should know the risk as well as the benefit to your whole body. Sometimes the dermatologist, and this is what happened to my father. My father had a benign, he was 89 years old, had a benign um, uh, disease of his forehead, forehead called pemphigus. It's a skin disorder, it's completely benign, doesn't look so great, but benign. He was put on 16 milligrams of prednisone daily. He's an 89-year-old guy. 89-year-old guy, 60 milligrams of prednisone for a year. And because he's old school and he tried... My father's a darn pediatric surgeon, one of the gods in pediatric surgery, literally. First person in Africa to be a pediatric surgeon. First Ran the first ever freestanding children's hospital. Great legacy. But he came from a world where he trusted his doctor. And I heard this and I went ballistic. And he's... My father had a conflict between this person that he trusted and everybody else. And what happened is, this is uh, 2019, 2020, so it was April of 2020. He then got one of the early, it was March of 2020, he got one of the earliest, earliest versions of COVID, before we even knew what COVID was. And his body was, could not fight COVID. Couldn't, he was older, but he couldn't fight COVID because he's on 60 milligrams of prednisone. And you can't stop the prednisone at that level. And he ended up dying of COVID in April of 2020. And while he may still have died of COVID, he was completely robbed of the opportunity to fight the disease because, because some dermatologist put him on a year's worth of 60 milligrams of prednisone and you can't taper it you can't you can't taper it quick enough so so be very very cautious about understanding risk as well as benefit there's no way on god's earth that the benefit of cleaning up some skin was worth that risk and yeah my dad's 89 years old he, a lot of other things going on may well have died anyway but he was robbed of the opportunity to try to fight the disease because they made sure with that level of prednisone that there was no way on God's earth he was going to survive. And that pisses me off to this day. But so often, guys, I get patients coming into my office and they put down two bags and they've got, <laughs> it's so funny, they got a three-page list. They got Supplements they take in the morning, supplements they take at lunchtime, and supplements they take at night, and they've got these pill boxes, and they've got rows and rows of them. And the expense of taking all this crap. You piss away your money, you buy into the supplements, and think that they're magically going to make you healthy, and they don't. And then you say, oh, whenever I have this thing, whenever my hair starts to fall out, I've got to take Nutrafoil. And, and if I take Nutrafol, my hair doesn't fall out. So we create causation where no such relationship exists. And we're taking these bags full of supplements. Folks, number one, learn to have discretion. I don't care how wonderful and how smart and how good looking that person, that influencer is. And how wonderful their story is, how magical their story is. 
ashwagandha. I love that word. They've even created it so sexy that it rolls off my tongue. I'll take it just so that I can say I'm on ashwagandha. But really? But oh yes, it works. It, it may do, it may not. But please don't be a victim of turmeric and cunol and out of the COVID era, ivermectin. Ivermectin does work. I'm not going to discount that, but you don't have to take it prophylactically. Be very, very cautious of all of these supplements that you now take that are supposed to magically give you something. Have discretion. And if you're going to take something, if you really buy into somebody's story, number one, go to Google and research it. And in particular, research the downside and research the alternatives. Because that gum flapper on the internet is not going to tell you what's wrong with the problem or what the expectations are. They sell magic. It's snake oil sales. So do your own independent research. And the beautiful, about, uh, beautiful thing about AI and, and Google is it usually will come up with a counter argument to anything. Even if I say, take this thing, come up with a counter argument. Secondly, look to see where you can get the same beneficial effect of any supplement from food you're eating or from an alteration in your eating pattern. If you're not harming yourself, if you're metabolically healthy, you don't need any supplements. Think that one through. We didn't have these available 100 years ago. Now suddenly we can't survive without them. And let's face it, we're not living any longer or shorter because we're taking a bunch of supplements. So then if you buy into something, you think the risks are low, you don't see an alternative, you want to add this to your, to your toolkit, design an experiment. Buy one bottle or buy one set of the stuff and do the experiment. So, okay, this is who I am. This is the effect I'm expecting to see. Take it for 90 days, take it for 60 days, and then reevaluate the effect. When the bottle runs out, reevaluate the effect. And if there's benefit, keep taking it. If there's no benefit, maybe you are hoodwinked. If you have to take two or three pills of the same thing each day, especially for a supplement, oh, I've got to take three of these capsules. That's bullshit. Be very aware of that. Supplements at most should be taken once a day. And if you're having to take one form in the morning, one form in the evening, that's problematic. And then the final piece of this, remember that everything is a bell curve. You may be slightly deficient in vitamin D. You may be slightly deficient in magnesium. I measure those levels all the time. But remember, there's a bell curve. And on the other side of the bell curve, as much if not more harm is caused by excess. And one of the commonest excesses I see is excess magnesium and excess D3, which is very debilitating. Excess magnesium can very badly affect the heart. Excess D3 robs the bones of calcium. Just Google hypervitaminosis D, and there's a very narrow range in which they work. Even medications, I talk a lot about colchicine. Colchicine is a very effective reducer of vascular inflammation that helps you to reduce your risk of a heart attack or a stroke. But more isn't better. More will kill you. So be very, very cautious about taking supplements at all. And if you are taking them, design an N of 1 experiment to see if there's benefit and make sure you understand the bell curve of dosing. Be smart about this, folks. Don't be a victim of the gum flappers on the internet. And if anybody is telling you to take something and then they're promoting or selling their own brand, that is hugely problematic. Now, let's, let's talk about me. Let's talk about things that I put out there, full disclosure. Full disclosure. There are three things that I use in my everyday life that I talk about a lot on this internet. One of the things that I do use quite a bit are exogenous ketones. I don't use them all the time. I use exogenous ketones to keep me in ketosis and for certain effects. So for example, if I've got a real, really bad headache, I'll take Tylenol, maybe once or twice a year. But I have Tylenol in my, in my cupboard. I have some aspirin there for the same reason, or if I get sick. So those I have in my, in my cabinet. I take fish oil every day, every day. I, don't, I eat fish, but I don't eat that often, but primarily because I've got a strong family history of Alzheimer's, and there's definitive proof that three omega fatty acid ratio protects your brain. Now, I'll tell you when I'm 100 whether it worked or not, but that's the one place where I'm a little bit evangelical. 
Other than that, I will use ketone IQ from time to time if I'm struggling to maintain a fast, if I'm dragging in the morning, um, if I'm feeling really nauseated, like I mentioned the other day on my boat when I was puking at the fish. I don't get seasick very often. But there is value to this. I use it ad hoc. And I will talk about this um, on, my, on my shows. Now, again, don't buy into this. It's an experiment. If you think there may be some value, if what I've talked about resonates and you've got the same problems, buy a little bit or get a little bit. We'll give, supplement, we'll give samples away here in the office. Try it. And if it doesn't work, abandon it, no matter what the hype. If you find benefit to it, use it for that benefit. I love my coffee. I drink a lot of coffee. But I'm also now starting to experiment a little bit. What do I drink at night? What do I drink if I don't want that caffeine effect? What happens if I'm a little intense and I want a surrogate for ca caffeine? Well, what I grew up with in South Africa was this stuff. It's called rebos tea. Okay, It comes from a, from a bush that grows in South Africa, in the western part of South Africa, my home area been harvested for years, for eons, by the bushman. And it's a tiny, fine little leaf that you put in hot water, you boil it, and it releases something called rebos tea. No caffeine, no caffeine, and a lot of anti-inflammatory properties to it. So as an alternative, I drink rebos tea, and the brand that I personally like is called Kingfisher. Okay. But you can get robust tea on the internet. So I will be speaking about that because I personally use it. Not all the time, but it's not even a supplement for me. It's just a drink alternative. It doesn't contain caffeine. Tastes really good. And it's something I can use in the evenings. My son, Rian, who's three years old, don't want to give him caffeine at this stage, but he'll have some with me. So we make a pot at home, pots on the stove as I grew up. And on the weekends, we'll all have a mug of, of uh, rebos tea. Now, with my son, I'll throw some milk or some heavy cream in there. I just tend to drink mine like this. You can drink it hot or cold. And then the third thing that I really, I use every day. Every day, all day. And I'm not ashamed to talk about this. And that is the Redmond Real Salt products. And the primary, there are a few reasons why I use it. Number one, the human body needs salt. Need salt, need salt, need salt. And I'll speak to that um, in some of my other shows. Salt is very important. Electrolytes as a secondary part are important as well. But I use salt all the time. And one of the concerns for me with sea salt are the plastics. So I like the old ancient mild, uh, mine salts. And Redmond is, some, is a product that's out there. Redmond is not overly expensive. It is independently verified as clean and pure for what's stated in there. And also, the Redmond folks are very supportive of our community. So that's a little bit of a bias, but Redmond Real Salt and their electrolytes, I really like them. I use them every day. My entire family uses them. And I will talk about them in conjunction with the emphasis on salt. That's it, folks. That's it. Those are products I personally use. Whether you want to put them in the supplement category, because I don't take anything. I take fish oil. That's it. So if I've made you think, if I've made you learn to be more scientific about your use of product, I am the Carb Addiction Doc. Throw us a penny, throw us a pound, throw us a, a dollar at our Patreon account, at our PayPal account, if you like this content. If you want to set up an evaluation of your uh, supplements you're taking, if you're one of those three bags of supplements a, a, a day p a person and you're not sure if they're doing you any benefit, I can give you my two cents worth and we can measure their levels. 561-517-0642. Give me a shout. But don't be a victim. Be smart. Do your own research of the alternatives, of the side effects, as well as the benefits. The gum flappers will always tell you about the benefits but they minimize the downside. Don't be a victim.